Psalm 6, as we go through the first 10 psalms in our study. I've entitled today's sermon, God Hears the Prayer of Those Who Trust in Him. Really, we could entitle the sermon this, God Hears the Prayer of the Depressed Believer. Or we could entitle it, God Hears the Prayer of the Believer Overcome with guilt. Let me give you a little background into Psalm 6. Another Psalm of David. We're not told exactly what the background is, but we can draw some conclusions and some inferences from the things that David's written. David has written in, in Psalm 6. It appears that he's looking back on his difficult life and recounting his own sins in light of God's majesty. It doesn't seem to be that he's just thinking about his big sins, but of the totality of his sins. He realizes that he has provoked God to wrath. Let me give you some examples of how he's done that. One of the ways he provoked God to wrath is in the hauling of the Ark of the Covenant on a cart and then getting angry when Uzzah was struck down by God for touching the Ark. First Chronicles 13, 10, 11 says this, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark and he died there before the Lord. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah and that place was called Perez Uzzah to this day. Or he might be thinking about this. That time when he wished he could have and should have killed Doeg the Edomite talked about that last week. Doeg was not a nice guy. You don't want him for a neighbor. He was one of the new shepherds of Saul, trying to find his upward mobility within the kingdom. He was an Edomite, therefore he was a descendant of Esau, not an Israelite. David was on the run. He runs to the priest in the city of Nob, priest's name was Ahimelech. David runs from Saul and doesn't have a sword with him. And the sword of Goliath is hidden there. And Ahimelech gives him the sword. Doeg the Edomite is there and he sees David and David sees him. Doeg goes back to Saul reports that he's seen David in the town of Nob and that the priest had given David the sword of Goliath. Saul comes back and Doeg thinks, this is my chance to impress the king. Maybe I can get a position better than shepherd. Well, he does get a position better than shepherd in the kingdom of Saul, the unregenerate first king of Israel. He gets the position as chief executioner. And Doeg kills every priest in the city of Nob and their wives and their children and their animals that day. Except for one of Ahimelech's sons. We find this in 1 Samuel 22, 22. And David said to Abiathar, he was the son of Ahimelech, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. Now, 
There's a little parentheses here that's not in the scriptures. But this stated inference, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. I knew what Doeg would do. I didn't act. The death of all the people resides on me. Live with that. How do you deal with that? Or David looking back on his life, his adultery with Bathsheba, doesn't even recall or, or recount in the text that we're looking at the, the assassination of Uriah. But what about the child that dies as a result of David's sin? Second Samuel 12, 16 and 17 says, David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not. Nor did he eat food with them. How do you, how do you live knowing that your sin caused the death of this child? Or what, what about thinking back on your life and your sin and God's pronouncement of judgment and, and your own son is killed. His son Absalom was killed by Joab and as a result of that, David fell into a deep depression and despair. After the battle's won, Absalom is, has been killed and his troops Absalom's troops routed. David's in this depression, and he's cried out, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, over and over and over again. And Joab hears it. 2 Samuel 19, verses 1 and 2, it was told to Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And Scripture tells us this, so the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard that day the king is grieving for his son. And it says that the people actually came into town like those who lost the battle would. Kind of sulking into town. No victory march, no victory cheer. Think back on a life like David had. We, we kind of hold him up as, oh, yeah, he had a couple of incidents that weren't so good. He was a life, his was a life full of trouble. And what we find in Psalm 6 is a man who is down in the pit, the pit of despair, depression, and like David, great men and women of God have faced spiritual depression and battled through it in faith. Depression is not sinful. We need to understand that. I think sometimes in biblical counseling we get the idea that if you're depressed, it's sinful. It is not sinful to be depressed. However, it becomes sinful when it leads to more and more and more despair. How do we deal with sin in our life? How do we deal with those things that cause us depression? Stand with me. Let's read Psalm 6. O oh Lord, Rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is also, also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? 
Return, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. You can be seated. Let me start by saying, as I've already said, depression is not sinful. But let me also say this. Contrary to what you might read in ads and what you might read or see on TV or hear on advertisements, depression is not a serious, serious medical condition. You heard it. Depression is not a serious medical condition. Something else is. If it's organic, treat the organic. But depression itself is non-organic, inorganic. You can't treat it with a pill. If it's organic, go to the doctor. He or she can look under a microscope, run some tests, find out what it is. Maybe it is a thyroid problem. Maybe it is a cancer problem. Maybe it's a nutrition problem. Not, not like the fake nutrition stuff, but really you have like iron poor blood. You're tired all the time. Maybe it's something that's organic. Otherwise, understand this. Depression is only a symptom. It is not the cause. Depression is never the cause. Depression is never the chief issue. Something else always is. Uh, ask yourself this question. We have all these medications for depression. Why don't they work? Why do we have now ads that say when your depression medication alone is not enough? Because it's not the cause, it's the symptom. And we're treating the symptom, not the cause. For believers, understand, there is a cause. And for David, it was a godly recounting of the sins of his past. Now, let me clarify this. Yes, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now, right now, this present time, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You, as a believer, are never going to answer for your sin again. If you've trusted Christ as Savior, all of your sin is under the blood of Jesus Christ. But understand this. To act as if you never sinned, to act as if and pretend that life never had troubles for you, that you have no consequences for the decision you made, is to be foolish with God's grace. You will never understand how great God's grace is, how great God's mercy is, unless you remember how much you don't deserve it. And I think one of, the, one of the tragedies of cheap salvation and cheap forgiveness today is the fact that we don't want people remembering their sin. That's not what David did. That's not even what Paul did. He called himself the chief of sinners, the least of the apostles. How could he do that? Because he knew his sin, but he also knew it was under the blood of Christ. Recounting personal sin should lead us to be distressed over our offense against holy God. 
One of, one of the modern day issues that we have in Christianity today is we don't understand how holy God is and we don't understand how sinful we are. And when you, when you uh, uh, refuse to look at how sinful you are, you'll never see how holy God is. And if you never see how holy God is, you'll never have a good um, interpretation and, and uh, evaluation of how sinful you are. You need them both. There will come a day when you'll never think about your sin again, but not in this life. Not in this life. In this life, we need to wake up every morning and say, God, I thank you that though I deserve death, you've given me life. David was recounting his personal sins against God. He also included in there the troubles that were in this life. David wishes to be rebuked and disciplined, but pleads that God would not pour out his anger and wrath on him. Here, here's what David is not saying. David is not saying, just be kind and loving and give me blessing. He does not say that. Look at Roman, or Psalm uh, 6 1. He says, O oh Lord, rebuke me. Doesn't he say that? O oh Lord, rebuke me, but not in your anger. And he says again, O oh Lord, discipline me, but not in your wrath. We need to make sure that we don't fall into this theology that God only is love and God only blesses because that's the prosperity gospel. If you have trouble in your life, according to the prosperity gospel, you must be out of step with God. You must not be in God's will. In fact, if life is bad for you, you probably aren't even a Christian. That's false. That's the gospel of the enemy. Believers should want God's discipline. Believers should want God's rebuke. Because when God disciplines us, he's working for our good and his glory. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, the writer of Hebrews having just gone through this wonderful list of men in particular and women also included in that who were glorifying God, he now comes to the issue of let's persevere in our faith. Let's keep going forward for the Lord. Look at verses 5 through 11. Let me back up to three so that you... Get the contact. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, that's Jesus, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is therefore what son is therefore whom for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he, God, disciplines us for our good. Why? That we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. 
to pray that God would not rebuke you, to pray that God would give you a life of ease, to pray that God would not discipline you, is to pray as an unbeliever, not as a believer. We need to remember, though, that when we, when we are there in those times and we, we think back upon our sin, we think back upon the trouble of life, that we don't lose heart. But in faith, we believe that only God's grace can bring, heal, bring healing to the bones that he has crushed. God crushes us. It's a good thing. He takes the lump of clay marred in his hands, Remember, going down to the potter's house, see this lump of clay, marred in, his, in the potter's hands, and he beats a thing silly back into this lump, and he reshapes it. The discipline of God is him crushing our bones, putting us on the potter's wheel, and pounding us crazy. Doesn't sound like a loving God, does it? He beats us. And reshapes us. But he does it all out of love. Look at Psalm 51. Let me read Psalm 62 first. Verse 2. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verses 7 to 9, David has committed adultery and Nathan the prophet comes to him and, and tells him the story and then rebukes David. And here's what David says in verses 7 through 9. Psalm 51, 7 through 9, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken. He, God broke them. Let them rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. When God crushes our bones, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to recount his grace and mercy. John Calvin said it this way, as when we know that the design of God in inflicting punishment upon us is to humble us, so we know whenever we are subdued under his rod, the gate is open for his mercy to come to us. In depression, particularly for Christians, depression has a goal. The goal is not to to cause you to be depressed and leave you in that lump of clay unmolded. The goal is to reduce you to absolute dependence upon the Lord of glory and then rely upon him to reshape you. In that process, there's mercy. In that process, there's grace. Like David, an awareness of the gravity of sin and suffering should overwhelm the soul of the true believer. We should be overwhelmed by our sin and our suffering. It should be there. This life, contrary to modern theology, this is not your best life now, and you as a believer cannot have your best life now. Nor should you want it. You should want to be crushed. You should want to be broken before the Lord. You should want him to remake you. Look at the first part of verse 3. My soul is also is greatly troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. Our, our, our uh, realization of our sin, looking back on our sin, ought to bring us to the point where we are so troubled. Why would God even save me? It's according to his mercy not according to my works. And we should be overwhelmed 
There's a sense where in spiritual depression, we are overwhelmed. There is a sadness that comes upon us. There's a sadness that overtakes the spiritually depressed person that they can't explain. But the spiritually depressed person needs to understand it's part of the process of being reshaped into the image of Christ. Even Jesus in Matthew 26 verse 38 said this, then he said to them, this is to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And they immediately went to sleep. But he declared as the perfect sinless son of God, knowing that the weight of the sin of all those whom God had given him was on him, he, he declared, my soul is very sorrowful, even to the point of dying. I feel like the weight of my sorrow is crushing me. Have you ever felt like that? The weight of my sorrow is more than I can bear. But understand, it's part of the process. It's part of the good that God is doing. And like David, the true believer turns his focus from sin and suffering to the Lord. We, we don't stay wallowing in the sin and suffering so that it now turns into self-pity. Self we don't allow ourselves to go to self-pity. We redirect our thoughts back to the Lord. Sin and suffering should not lead to self-pity. Sin and suffering should lead to looking to Christ. Second part of verse 3. But you, O oh Lord, there's this stop, this break, this like he didn't even finish his sentence. His, have you ever asked the question, how, how long? How long is this going to go on? Lord, I know that your grace is sufficient. Lord, I know that you're merciful. I, you've brought me low. You've crushed my bones. I'm looking to you, Lord. How long? It's okay to ask the question, how long? As long as the question is asked in faith. Matthew chapter 26, turn there please. Matthew 26, going on in the part of the, the, the text that we just read about Jesus being sorrowful, even unto death. Matthew 26, um, verses... Uh, 39 and 42. Verse 39, and going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Lord, I will stay where I'm at as long as you want me here till I learn, from our perspective, well, I, well, till I learn what I need to learn. Jesus is saying, Lord, uh, not my will from a human perspective, but your will, I will stay in this until you accomplish what you sent me to accomplish, which was our salvation. Verse 42. Again, for a second time, he went away and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. There was not a, why me? Why not somebody else? Why do bad things always happen to me? Have you ever asked that? I've asked that. And the answer really is this. 
Because God's teaching me. Because God's teaching you. Those who trust in God turn to him in their despair. You really have two choices. You can stay wallowing in your depression slash self-pity, or you can turn to the Lord in your despair and allow him to lift you out of it. The problem is this. Be very careful. In whose timing? It needs to be in God's timing. But when do I want it? I want out now. I, I want the bones that you've crushed to be healed immediately. When God crushes bro- bones, it takes time to heal. But those who trust in God turn to him in the time of their despair. The suffering believer calls upon God and his steadfast love for deliverance. When you're suffering, when you're down, when, when you are reminded of your sin, of your failure, of the suffering that you've gone through, instead of blaming God and declaring, if you loved me, you would not have brought this on me, it is in fact the fact that he loves you that he brought it on you. Turn to him for deliverance. Psalm 6.4. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life, save me, so that my life will be better. Is that right? No, it does not say that at all. It says, turn, O Lord, and some of you are like, what translation is he using? <laughs> turn, O Lord, deliver my life, save me for the sake of your steadfast love. When you call upon Lord, the desire for deliverance should not be because of self. It should be because of God. Psalm 25, verses 6 and 7. We can, we can pray this. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. How? According to your steadfast love. Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. The motivation for change, the motivation for getting out of the spiritual depression should not be my relief. The goal and motivation for for getting out and finding relief from spiritual depression should be for the the glory of God and his steadfast love to be evidenced in my life. David didn't long for death, but for life, that he might continue to praise God to the people of the earth. Here's one of the problems that we've got with a modern day psychological movement that just gives drugs. Have you looked at the list of side effects for these drugs for depression which may cause suicide? I thought it was supposed to cure it, not kill it. The answer isn't the pills. The answer is the Lord. And we need to trust in the Lord. David didn't want to die. He wanted to live. So many people today, we have an epidemic, particularly of teenage suicide. Why? Because they've been told, A, there is no God. B, you're just an evolved creature that gets in the way of, of everything else on earth. You are a blot. Every place you go, you're having a carbon effect on the world. You got to remove yourself from it so that you don't cause global warming or climate change now. You're the problem with everything. What we're saying to children is the world will be better off without you. Now, they're not coming out and saying that, but everything they're teaching 
is screaming that the world would be better off without you. And the reality is, the world was made for humans. Everything else is to be subdued under us. We are to be caretakers of the world. But we're not to worship the world. David wanted to live. We need to begin again to give a message to young people that causes them to want to live. And frankly, removing every motivation from their life for life is not going to give them the motivation to live. What's David's motivation? He didn't long for death, but for life, that he might continue to praise God to the people of the earth. Verse 5, for in death there is no remembrance of you in Sheol, who will give you praise? Now, he's not talking about eternal life or the next phase of life. He's talking about the actual act of dying. You walk through a cemetery, and contrary to anything you see on movies, they're not going to rise up from the grave. They're not going to creep you out. In fact, I find cemeteries to be very peaceful. They never interrupt a thought. Right? They, they, they never get in my way. They don't interact at all with us. Why? Because they're dead. And what, what David is saying is, look, once you die, your opportunity for giving praise to God is done. Human beings, any other human being, will not be able to profit from your praise. Psalm 30, verses 9 and 10, David says this, What profit is there in death? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. Matthew Henry said this, the death of the body puts an end to our opportunity and capacity of glorifying God in this world and serving the interests of his kingdom among men by opposing the powers of darkness and bringing many on this earth to know God and devote themselves to him. You'll never have another opportunity after you die to share Jesus Christ with anyone. You will never, ever have the opportunity to help someone grow and change in Christ. You will never, ever again have the opportunity to share the love of God and the, the grace of God with anyone because in death, that testimony of yours is silenced unless you write a book or have a YouTube channel. But in David's day, when, you, when you're gone, you're gone. And all of your influence is over. But we, we have this epidemic, even among Christians, where we try everything but praising God. We try everything but living for Him. We try everything but, but leaning upon His steadfast love and end up with even people in the church who profess faith in Jesus Christ ending their lives and it's giving a horrible message to the world. What hope is there if Christians are hopeless? And the Apostle Paul understood this, this dilemma, this mixed desire of the believer. Yes, we want to be with the Lord. Yes, we don't want to leave the earth. So here's what Paul said to the church at Philippi and Philippians 1, 23 and 24, I'm hard pressed between two. There's only two choices here, live or die. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your account. Uh, I want to go be with Jesus, but you need me. Now understand this, God doesn't need me. You need me. Paul saying, the Philippian church, you got a long ways to go in your Christian life, and God has raised me up to be an apostle to the Gentiles, and I'm going to stay here for you. I'd rather be with Jesus 
you guys can't match Jesus, but he wants me here with you. I'm going to stay here for you. The spiritually depressed person can be very tempted to say, poo on you. I just want to go be with Jesus and then end it. What kind of a testimony is that? We need to be willing to allow God to give us the extended life that he has declared as long as he gives us life and let him take us. In your spiritual depression, suicide should never, ever, ever, can't put enough evers on it, ever be part of your conversation. Never. Because in suicide, there's only one person you're thinking about. Oh, my family would be better off without me. Liar. You know that's not true. Oh, this life is too hard. People would be better off without me. Liar. That's not true. Live the life that God has given you while he gives it to you and let him take you when he's done with you. He will. You can be sure of that. He didn't need Charles Spurgeon to live forever. He didn't need John Calvin to live forever on earth. He didn't need Augustine to live forever. He he didn't need Martin Luther to live forever. Like David, as recorded in Acts, they they fulfilled God's purpose in that generation, and then they died. That's our goal. Fulfill God's purpose in your generation and let God take you home when he sees fit. Those who are overwhelmed by sorrow and suffering should be encouraged to take their sorrows to the Lord, but always remember that God is holy, holy, holy. What I mean by that is when you take your sorrows to the Lord, be very careful what you say. God is not your buddy. We have a day, we live in a day where children can say whatever they want to their parents without any any repercussion, without discipline. God's not that way. He must be approached in a way that gives him honor and glory, reverence. Like David, there are times when tears become the testimony of a broken heart. There are are times when you don't really need to say anything to God. He sees and hears your tears. Verses 6 and 7. I am weary, weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. There are times when words, even from the depressed person, are meaningless. And sometimes the depressed person just needs to sit before God and cry. He hears the tears that you cry. Matthew Henry said it this way. Speaking of David, he said, his tears had a voice, a loud voice, in the ears of the God of mercy. Silent tears are not speechless ones. God hears your tears. Nobody else can hear your tears. God hears your tears. Psalm 31, verses 9 and 10, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasting from grief. My soul and my body also. My life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Spurgeon put it this way. The psalmist had groaned till his throat was hoarse. God's people may groan, but they may not grumble. Yes, they must groan, being burdened, or they will never shout in the day of deliverance. Let's move away from this Song of the 80s. 
don't worry, be happy. It's a catchy tune. It's bad theology. Sometimes we just need to cry. Sometimes we just need tears. We Christians must be careful that we not impose our joy onto others when joy is not fitting for the moment. There is a time to weep from the soul. Sometimes joy is not fitting. I'm one of those guys that I like to bring a little levity into tense moments, which my wife reminds me is sometimes inappropriate. There are times we need to weep with those who weep. James put it this way. James 4, 9. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Jesus was a man of sorrows. He wasn't the comedian. And I think if more pastors tried to emulate Jesus than the Saturday Night Live group, Christians would grow in the Lord. Church is not Comedy Central. Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3 prophesies of Jesus by saying he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We see Jesus in John eleven thirty five, 35, shortest verse in the Bible. We all have it memorized. Jesus wept. You don't even have to stumble over it. It's two words. You've got it memorized. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. That's important. Hebrews 5, 7 says this of Jesus. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to weep. There's a time to cry. But let it all be in reverence to God. Faith-filled trust in God and rest in His grace brings healing to the, healing to the sorrowful, suffering soul. Faith-filled trust in God and rest in His grace brings healing to the sorrowful, suffering soul. Like David, we need to separate from those who are not good for our soul. There are times when the world is too much for the believer and we have to separate from the world. It may be your job. If your job is tempting you in such a way that you are too weak to withstand the temptations on the job, find a new job. If it is such that the friends you hang out with are too much for you and they're causing you to sin or tempting you to sin and you're not strong enough to withstand it, leave them. But I've been with them since high school. Tough. What's more important, your friendship or your soul? Look at verse 8. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. Are you sick of your sin? Are you tired of doing the same old, same old sins? Then maybe you need to think about who you're hanging out with. Maybe you need to think about who you ought to be hanging out with. 
Psalm 119, verse 115 says, Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. You're hindering me from loving the Lord and obeying the Lord. I gotta find new friends. I gotta find new co-workers. I gotta I need to do something. Now, the little parentheses here is you don't have to find a new spouse. All right? Please understand that. There's a limit to what we're discussing here. You don't need to find new children. God has put them in your life, and if they are tempting you to sin, that's God's way of saying to you, uh, maybe you need to do some heart surgery. But where we can clean up our friends, we need to. At the judgment... Christ will separate the wicked eternally from the righteous. There's going to be a separation. In eternity, think about it, there's never going to be a temptation again, there's never going to be a trial, there's never going to be any sin. But here's what God says, Christ says in Matthew 7, 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Or Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. There's going to be a separation that takes place. You may not have the courage to separate from the evil today. God has no problem with it. He has no problem with it. And he will bring that separation in the end. The answer to our spiritual depression comes from believing that the Trinity hears our prayers. Sometimes I think we can get a little confused when we say, God hears your prayers. Uh, which person? Only the Father? Well, what happens to the Son and the Spirit then? Well, let's see what Scripture says. Verse 9 The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. Now, you find the Lord, in verses, verse 8, 9, 10, three times he's declaring that God has heard him. The word capital Lord is Yahweh, God of the Old Testament. Yes, the Lord our God, he is one. But, and we would say that too, but we are... Trinitarian monotheists, meaning we believe in God and the three persons that he is. So Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 to 25. Turn there, please. Hebrews 7, 22 through 25. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to him through uh, to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for for them. Jesus Christ ascended to the right hand of the throne of God and he prays for believers. He always lives to make intercession for them. Romans chapter 8 verse 26, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit of God intercedes for us. The Trinity is involved in hearing our prayers, not just the Father. The enemies of your soul who have provoked you to sin will be judged by the one who loves you. You see, David's gone through this whole thing. He's looking back. He says, yes, I've sinned. Others provoked me to sin. Those people who provoked me to sin, God's going to judge them. Verse 10. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. 
Psalm 40, verse 14. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. If those you hang out with don't have your soul in mind for good, helping you glorify the God, God, if, you, if they're not doing that, then either you need to begin to initiate that in the conversation or you need to separate from them. Psalm 56, 9 through 11. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Stop freaking, about, about, stop freaking out about people and what they did or will do and begin to trust in God. Spiritual depression is a real thing, but it's a symptom, not a cause. And we need to begin to see God high and lifted up and trust in him. Would you stand with me and we'll pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that even through the life of David, a man of God, that while he found himself in that spiritual depression, he always trusted in you. May we, Father, trust in you. For those who don't know you, may you be glorified in calling them to yourself this day through faith in Christ, making their hearts alive through the Spirit of God. Thank you, Father, for doing a mighty work. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.